We've talked a bit recently about Obamacare, Barack Obama's plan to take over the American health care business, effectively nationalizing one-seventh of the U.S. economy and hiring 16,000 new IRS agents to enforce the laws, including fines for citizens who don't want government insurance. But mainly we've been talking around the subject about goofy details like the meltdown of the website healthcare.gov that was supposed to make signing up quick and easy. According to press reports, that website cost over half a billion dollars to create. It was so buggy, so slow, so overwhelmed, so complicated, so useless that in a country of more than 300 million people, weeks after the website's launch, some states were reporting the number of people who had managed to sign up was numbered just in the dozens. Uh, people were sick of waiting through page after page of complex websites being asked to give highly personal health information, running into problems, then being asked to phone a 1-800 number, waiting for hours online, and then just to be directed back to the website. What a mess. And the whole site was designed in a tricky way. You had to divulge all of your private information first before you could see what the possible prices of your new government insurance plans would be. If this were a private company, it would be out of business already. But that's the great thing about government, eh? No matter how crummy it is, it never goes out of business. Uh, but enough talk about the details and scandals and glitches. In fact, the broken website and the useless call center staff are the best thing about Obamacare. They're probably keeping millions of Americans away from it by so frustrating them that they'll never try to sign up again. To me, the real problem would be if the website and phone numbers did work. If Obama just kept hiring armies of bureaucrats and consultants and contractors throwing billions of dollars at the problem, maybe just hiring the liberals at Amazon.com or Facebook.com or Google.com, all big Democrat donors, just to run the website for them. I mean, the website is a disaster. It's, it's not secure. There are dangerous reports about the risk of identity theft, but the real disaster would be if it does work. I I'm going to try not to get too technical. Let's keep it common sensey. I mean, let's start with this. If you were to get sick anywhere in the world, in any country, where would you want to be? It's a real question that tourists sometimes ask, right? I mean, if you were on a Caribbean vacation, would you rather get sick in Cuba or Mexico or Florida? Would you rather get sick in China, India, Brazil, or New York City? I mean, the question is obvious. America has by far the best health care in the world, not just for the elites, but for the masses. I mean, we know this because so many Canadians flee to the United States for health care simply to avoid waiting in line in Canada for months or years for medical care. They've got the best medical schools there, the best doctors, the best hospitals, the best medical research, the best new drugs, the best high-tech equipment. If you're rich, you get amazing care at places like the Mayo Clinic. If you're poor, you get amazing care too because it is actually against the law for any U.S. hospital that takes federal funding to turn away an emergency patient because of his inability to pay. That's why big hospitals in Florida and Texas and California spend hundreds of millions of dollars providing free, top-notch health care to illegal immigrants from Mexico. Hell, it's a big reason why there are so many people streaming in from Mexico in the first place. The myth by anti-American extremists in Canada that if you don't have $100,000, you can't get surgery in the United States is not just untrue, it's crazy. I mean, if it were true, you would literally see people staggering around the United States dying. In fact, it's Canada where we have half a million or more people waiting in lines for heart surgery or cancer care. So the first question is, why would anyone try to fix an American system that wasn't really broken in the first place? At the best of times, but Obama was not elected in the best of times. He was elected as America was tripping in a financial crisis, heading into the worst recession since the 1930s. You would think creating jobs creating economic growth would be the most pressing issues in his America. But instead, Obama focused all of his political capital on nationalizing health care. Huh? Why in a recession? Now, it's true. No system is perfect. And in the United States, many people got health care insurance through their work. So if they lost their job, they'd lose their health insurance, at least until they got a new job. Okay, fine. So let's create some jobs. And in the meantime, if there are some Americans who fall through the craps, uh, cracks, uh, focus help on them, right? I mean, some people lose their jobs and can't afford to buy food either. America gives out food stamps. It's a form of welfare that can be used to buy groceries in any store. And, of course, there's food banks and private charity. But no one would say nationalize all the restaurants, nationalize all the supermarkets because some people are poor and can't afford steak. 
Well, no one would say that other than someone ideologically who believes in the government owning the means of production, someone opposed to the free market. Hey, don't say Obama didn't warn us about that. We are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. Yeah, that was him on the eve of his 2008 election. Nationalizing one-seventh of the U.S. economy is a fundamental transformation, not just of economics, though, but of society, of the barriers between what's private and what's now a public matter, of your relationships with your doctor, your hospital, who gets to look at your health records. It's part of a larger ideology that believes that the state has a role in every aspect of your life, including your own body. The same impulse to rule, to boss people around, that has liberal politicians pledging to ban trans fats or salt and smoking and forcing you to wear helmets when you bicycle and only have eight ounce big gulps. That's the same impulse that seeks to control your body as the property of the state. Oh, and to get their hands on all of your private data and to have that system run by the IRS. I would never have thought that Americans would go for this. The country that was born in a freedom revolution, the country whose birthday is called Independence Day. But Americans aren't genetically superior to any other country. It's a culture of freedom. And cultures can be changed slowly, but surely. I firmly believe that the invasive, bureaucratic, nonsensical, bossy TSA, that's the airport security in the United States, that 10 years of forcing ordinary law-abiding citizens to submit to arbitrary personal searches of having any government thug in uniform being able to touch your body especially in your private places, to being able to scan you in a see-through clothing scanners for no real reason other than a half-hearted attempt at security theater, but really just to perpetuate another government agency with another government bureaucracy. I believe that 10 years of obedience conditioning has started to drum out America's belief in independence and freedom and privacy. It's almost like the entire country gave a collective shrug when it learned that Obama's National Security Agency was recording every single phone call and every single email in the country. Of course, they've been ripe for having their doctor becoming an agent of the state. I mean, the 10 years of conditioning and the useless Republican Party in Washington is so corrupted by the process and the perks and the system that it hasn't been able to articulate a principled objection to Obamacare. Now, Obama is more passionate about collectivizing health care than just about anything else he's done as president. I mean, he, he really doesn't care about Iraq or Afghanistan. He skipped his briefings on Syria in the middle of the crisis. He's golfed more than any other president in history. His aides talk about how many hours he spends playing cards, playing basketball. He really doesn't give a damn about details or about governing at all or about making things work. But the one thing he does care about is ideology, is transforming America from an outlier in terms of freedom an exceptional country in terms of freedom, into just another social democracy with a big welfare state and a permanent governing class tending to a permanent class of entitled takers. It reminds me of Joseph Stalin's brutal forced collectivization of the peasant farms of, the, of Ukraine in the 1930s. Of course, I do not equate the death of 7 million Ukrainians to Obamacare, but I do find similarities in terms of Obama's class warfare, a loathing of doctors. He hates insurance companies, private hospitals. I think Obama actually hates private med medicine more than he loves government-run health care. He doesn't even care if the new system works. It, it surely won't. He just wants to destroy the old system. Obama certainly promoted his plan using the language of class warfare. Why should rich people have insurance but not poor people? But he tried to present it as an economic improvement, too. He, he repeatedly said that his Obamacare would, quote, bend the cost curve down. That's a jargony way of saying make health care cost less? But does anyone in the world believe that Obama could make anything cost less, that he could run anything more efficiently than private enterprise? What, like he runs his own government, the highest debt in history, or like he runs GM, General Motors, and it's owned by the government? No one could even do that. I mean, because Obama said he wanted to expand the health care system to cover poor people and to cover people with pre-existing health conditions. How, how can you cover more people for more things and make it all cost less. That, that's impossible. But that's exactly what he promised. Listen. You'll be able to get lower cost health care. Here in California, it's estimated it'll be you know, 20, 30 percent cheaper sure. than what you're already getting. And we'll give you subsidies, you know, uh, tax credits, essentially, if you still can't afford it. 
Well, if you're a low information voter watching Jay Leno, hey, why not? Free stuff and soak the rich. And Obama was promising doctors that everything would be the same too, even though everything was about to be revolutionized. Look at this. And that means that no matter how we reform health care, we will keep this promise to the American people. If you like your doctor, you will be able to keep your doctor, period. If you like your health care plan, you will be able to keep your health care plan, period. No one will take it away, no matter what. My view is that health care reform should be guided by a simple principle. Fix what's broken and build on what works. And that's what we intend to do. Well, that was the promise. But it was as impossible to keep as a lower cost, higher output collective farm promise in Ukraine. It was as impossible as a customer service friendly TSA airport security pat down. So on the eve of Obamacare becoming law, everything's happening that you might expect to happen to pay for the increased benefits for old, sick, poor people. Well, young people's insurance rates have skyrocketed. According to Manhattan Institute analysis, the average insurance premium for young men in America will increase by 97% and for young women by 62%. This is under the individual mandate. The Chicago Tribune analyzed the lowest price Obamacare insurance policies for their city and found that the only way they remain affordable is that they have huge new deductibles. 8,000 bucks per family. That means you have to pay the first $8,000 of your health care out of your own pocket before your insurance kicks in. Obamacare just cannot work as promised unless people pay more and get less. So millions just won't even bother signing up. They'll just pay the fines for dropping out. Millions of Americans won't even be offered a chance to sign up. Let me give you an example. Florida Blue has announced that it is canceling 300,000 families' insurance policies in the state. Just cancel them. Kaiser Permanente in California has already canceled 160,000 insurance policies. They just can't offer what Obamacare forces them to offer at prices. Uh, Independence Blue Cross, the biggest insurer in Philadelphia, is dropping 45% of its individual customers. Just, it's gone. Just dumping them with a letter of apology. Oh, it's not just insurance companies. Uh, IBM, 110,000 IBM retirees have been told their company plan is being canceled. 15,000 spouses of UPS workers have been dropped from the plan. They just can't bend the cost curve while offering more that Obama says they have to because the government had a better idea than had been working for decades. But companies are smart, you know. They know that they're only required to offer costly insurance under Obamacare to employees who work more than 30 hours a week. So companies are shifting millions of workers from full-time jobs to part-time jobs to evade the law. As the Teamsters Union said, Obamacare will, quote, destroy the foundation of the 40-hour work week that is the backbone of the middle class. Of course they will. It's not just companies downgrading jobs from full-time to part-time. 40% of U.S. employers tell Gallup polls that they have frozen hiring because of Obamacare. It is a disaster. It's the destruction of an industry. It's jeopardizing the health care of Americans. It's destroying the proper boundaries between our private lives and the government. But to Obama, it is a great success. He has fundamentally transformed one-seventh of the U.S. economy and much more. He has transformed America, making it less free.